eyes, blonde hair, and white skin. I lived and grew up in an area of California where I made friends with people of all colors. In fact, if you looked at the demographics of the schools that I attended, the white kids were the minority. It was normal to me. It was normal to have good friends, best friends that were Vietnamese, Mexican, Samoan, Chinese, African American, whatever ethnicity group you want to throw in there, I probably had a friend within that group. My family, my home life was broken up when my father made some bad decisions and my mom went back to work. And so after school, it wasn't necessarily safe yet for me to just be home alone. And so our next door neighbors, the wife and the mother, looked after me until my mom got home from school. And they were from the country of Laos. And she was a wonderful woman. And my mom trusted her with me. One of the things that I learned from my mom, one of the great lessons, is that she exemplified the love of God to all mankind. It didn't matter who you are, she had an open heart for you. And as I look back on my childhood, I'm grateful for the experiences and the environment that I was raised in. You see, racism and prejudice for me was just something in the history books. I learned about slavery, the 13th Amendment, the Holocaust, the Civil Rights Movement from U.S. history courses. That's where I learned it from. I didn't learn it from life experience. I didn't see it happening to my friends around me. And so to me at that time, it was all in the past. It surely wasn't happening today. But very soon it hit home. My brother got a job at Toys R Us and there was a woman working there that he thought was beautiful. He was nervous to ask her out. Extremely nervous. I don't think he had dated anyone before. But he did, he asked her out and they had a wonderful relationship and eventually he asked her to marry him. She was a black woman. This was when my eyes began to be opened. There were people in my family, there were people even within the church that while they wouldn't openly come out and make statements or make judgments, they certainly talked to my brother in private about how they felt with his decision. And I am not privy to all the information and all the conversations or anything that took place, but I know that it was a heavy burden for him to take on and for her. It was no longer in the history books. It was happening to my family. I remember my brother telling, telling me of certain people that didn't like it simply because of the color of her skin. This was hard for me to understand. It was hard to comprehend. She was a beautiful woman, and he loved her. To this day, my, my brother and his wife still have to deal with the fact that people can't look past or see through the color of their skin. He is a preacher for the Lord's church, just like me. However, he is forced to look for jobs in certain parts of the country because he won't be a candidate in other places. And he knows it, and so he simply chooses to look in certain places only. Not only because he wouldn't be a candidate, but also because he would not feel safe with his family in those places. A few years ago, I lost my job and I was looking for a new place. 
I went on a few different interviews, and in one location, the leadership felt that it was necessary to, to do something, to make sure that they found a candidate that fit their demographic. This congregation was, was very mixed. And so the leadership, what they did is they all had name tags when my wife and I met them. And they made sure that they swapped name tags around so that it looked like they were all mixed couples. And of course, for me, it, it didn't bother me one bit or my wife. We grew up with, with many people being married to all kinds of different people. So it had no, no bearing on us. We didn't get it. We didn't understand it. We just looked at them as normal. And they appreciated that. It wasn't until that evening when we all went to dinner and we saw them all sitting next to different people that they explained to us that they switched name tags. And they told us the reason why they did it. They wanted to find someone, a preacher, that would come in and not, not have a problem with the demographics or the mixed marriages and the families in that congregation. And I totally understand why they did it. But it was so disheartening to see that in 2017, at the time, skin color was still that big of a deal. Racism and prejudice was still that big of a problem. And not just in America, but in the church. I don't understand the hate. I understand hate in general. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, even God hates. It says, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies and one who spreads strife among brothers. There are things that I dislike. There are things that I hate. And you better believe I hate the same things that the Lord hates. But I don't understand the hate that comes because someone was born with a certain color of skin. And of course, today and over the past couple of weeks, the issue of racism, prejudice, has raised its ugly head in America once again. A situation involving police officers and George Floyd, and of course, there's been a number of protests and a number of things that have gone on. And as I have watched, as I have read, as I have listened, and as I have talked to others, it's made me ask the question, what's, what's the answer? Where is the answer? Will the answer be found in peaceful protests? Will it be found in violent protests? Will it be found in a new law or a new amendment? Will it come from new leadership? And as I continue to ask the question and search, I came to the conclusion that there is no answer. You see, as long as man does what's right in his own eyes, there is no answer that can be found. As long as we rely on our own wisdom and on man's wisdom, we will not find the answer. Because man hates, man sins, man divides, man sees the differences with his own physical eye and he can't see past the outside of the, of the person and see the heart and the soul of the individual. We will not find an answer if we simply rely on ourselves. There's no solution to our current problems or our future struggles, at least there is no answer without Jesus. What I want you to understand is I'm not saying well, as long as we have preachers, as long as we have people that will just 
sprinkle Jesus into the communities and make sure that they proclaim messages that people will hear it and that change will happen. That's not exactly what I mean. I don't mean that Jesus just has to be a part of the solution. What I mean is Jesus is the solution. And that the only way he is the solution is if you follow him wholeheartedly. Is that you give him your all. That you truly believe that he is the son of God. That he is who he said he is. That he loves all mankind. The answer begins and ends with Jesus. And as long as the hearts of men are not submitted to God, the solution won't come. We had read for us just a moment ago from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, where Jesus is being tested and challenged, but he's asked a question. And this text is a text that preachers have preached on multiple times. I've preached on this text multiple times. But as you read it, and Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? In verse 37, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It begins with love. And if you go all the way back to the beginning, it certainly began with God's love. You see, God first loved us, as John said in 1 John chapter 4. We love him because he first loved us. God is our creator. He created us. He made us. He loves us. And he cares for us. See, the answer is not going to be found just because more laws are introduced. You want to know how I know that? Because men are good at breaking laws. When the world was created, God gave man everything. And there was only one commandment. There was only one thing that man was told not to partake. Do not eat from this tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else in this, in this garden is free for you. You can eat of all of it. Just don't eat from that tree. Just one. And man broke it. And we see the fall of man and we see sin enter into the world. And we see God make a new covenant with the Israelites. With Abraham. And he makes a promise. And we see God deliver unto them a number of laws. We see first the Ten Commandments, but as you continue to read, some have estimated 613 different laws given to the Israelites. Of those 613 laws, every single one of them was broken at some point by an Israelite. I'm not saying that new laws should not be implemented. I'm not saying that Changes should not be made. I encourage some great changes that need to be made. But what I'm saying is we can't just put our faith in the government. We can't put our faith in ourselves. We can't put our faith in people to do it right all the time. We need to put our faith where it belongs, and that's in God. We need to understand that God loved us so much, and He realized, He understood, that the law wasn't enough. See, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, there's this law that was given, and it was right, and it was holy. See, there was nothing wrong with the laws that God gave to the Israelites. It taught them what sin was. It was right. It was holy. This is what God expected them to do. This is what God expected them not to do. But 
But as Paul says, sin took advantage through the law. But in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, God understood that the law wasn't enough for man. Man was going to need an example. Man was going to need a sacrifice. And so God loved us so much that he didn't just create us and leave us here on the earth to fend for ourselves. Instead, he created us and he sent his son for us. His son was a sacrifice for us. And when you see Jesus on the cross in your mind's eye, what do you see? I see a naked man with a crown of thorns, with blood flowing down. But I also see a man with his arms outstretched. Now they were nailed to a cursed tree. But as you see those arms outstretched, what do you see? It's as if Jesus is calling all peoples, all nations to come to him. To receive him, that he would receive them. That the blood that is flowing down would forgive them of their sins. We see that God loved us so much in the sending and the sacrifice of his son. And we see in this commandment that certainly I need to love God with all my heart, with all my mind, and with all my soul, and with all my strength. But Jesus adds something else. He doesn't just give the answer that they wanted to hear. He gave the truthful answer. And he said, oh, by the way, there's another law you need to pay attention to. In verse 39, he says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now when the preacher says you should love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, with all your strength. Man, I, I can accept that. I love God. I've got no problem with God. But when Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself. That's where it gets a little bit more difficult, doesn't it? You see, Jesus isn't just talking about the neighbor that's right next door to you that, well, I'm going to do what I can to get along with them because we share a fence or because we, we share some land. We butt up to one another and I don't want to have any bad blood between me and them. The neighbor is your fellow man. As Jesus illustrated in Luke chapter 10, with who we call the Good Samaritan. The neighbor is your fellow man. And he doesn't say that you love them because you like them. It's easy to love someone that you get along with, isn't it? It's easy to buy gifts for someone that buys you gifts. It's easy to be happy around someone that makes you happy. But here we're told to love your neighbor, your fellow man, as yourself. And that love isn't an emotional love. It's the same kind of love that God loves us with. It's the same kind of love that Jesus loves us with. The kind of love that took him to the cross. The kind of love that held him there. When we sing a song, he could have called 10,000 angels. But it was the love of Christ, the love of God that held him there. Because he wanted to save you. And he wanted to save me. And as we consider the love that we ought to have for one another... 
It's a self-sacrificing love. It's a love that says, I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I'm going to love you. I'm going to put your interests above my own. I want to make sure that you know who Jesus is. I want to make sure that your soul is saved. That you have eternal life. The idea of division and factions and hate and different things happening isn't one that's new. It's happened for generations. It's happened throughout human history. And when the church began in the first century, there were divisions in the church then. In fact, if you look through your New Testament, you'll find that many of the letters written were because of factions, divisions, and disruptions over things that were different. For some, it was because it was just, I'm a Jew and you're a Gentile. And now we've all come together under Jesus, but I don't know how this is supposed to work. For others, it was because, well, I'm esteeming myself higher than you. For others, it was, well, I heard the gospel from Paul. Well, I heard the gospel from Apollos. Well, that might be true, but it's Jesus who I follow. And we make divisions and we make factions over all kinds of things. But Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a section on the word love. And it helps us understand the kind of love that God wants us to have for our fellow man, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. We are to love our fellow man. We are to love our God. I want you to understand that hating your fellow man or hating a brother or sister in Christ is not okay. Whether it's because of the color of their skin or whether it's because of something else. As John emphasizes in the letter of 1 John, he says in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness is has blinded his eyes. He says it again in another place in 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 19. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. If you do not love your brother in Christ, if you do not love your fellow man the way that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 22 as he quotes from the Old Testament, do you really love God? Based on what John is saying here in 1 John, I can't love God the way that Jesus talked about if I hate my brother. And so we need to make sure that we love God. One of the ways in which we love God is not just saying I love him, but it's by showing you love him by loving others. As long as we are outside of Christ and outside of a relationship with God, we will continue to look at our fellow man with lenses that are tainted, smudged, and blurry. But if we really want to make a change, if we truly want to make a change, then it starts with Jesus. You need to have a relationship with him. You need to submit yourself to him. And once you do, you'll begin to see people through the lens of Christ. And you'll see them in a whole new light. You'll learn that it has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It has nothing to do with whether they're rich or poor. It has nothing to do with any physical or mental handicaps that they might have. But it has everything to do with the fact that they were created in the image of God and that your Lord and Savior died for them and is their Lord and Savior too. Behave in a manner worthy of God. Behave in a manner of the one who called you. And as I think about what, what to do, I'm reminded of Micah chapter 6 where Micah relays to the Israelites what God requires of them. And does, does God want us to come and ask for forgiveness and worship Him and praise Him with all of our might? Read with me Micah chapter 6 and verse 6. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God.